Now I've never watched Riverdale, honestly, but I know it's just gotten wilder and wackier over time. Tracking down serial killers, dying and coming back to life, performing musical numbers, gaining superpowers, and even surviving a cataclysmic meteor strike, with Cheryl Blossom managing to stop it, are some of the things I know have happened. So in the sixth season, reality gets twisted with the final episode ending to see all the characters being teenagers again, now living in the 1950s with no memories of anything that happened in Riverdale season 6 except for Jughead. So it will be interesting to hear how it all comes to an end in 2023's season 7. But speaking of the end, in an interview with Variety, Lily Reinhardt chatted about seeing Riverdale season 7 officially head into its end. Reinhardt spoke heavily about it being a bittersweet feeling to say goodbye to Riverdale after having worked on the show since she was 18 years old. She said, quote, There are a lot of feelings. Bittersweet is the word because I obviously will miss this group of people that I've been through half of my 20s with. She continued, But I do think the show has done so much for all of us and we're all so ready to show the world what else we've got. And bouncing right off those words, Reinhardt recently did an interview with BuzzFeed where she spoke about exactly what else she does got. In the interview she said, quote, In the last year and a half I've been hard hard at work developing the projects that I'm going to do after Riverdale. I'm really trying to set up a slate of things for when the show ends, to jump right into because I know I'll be ready to dip my feet into all these different projects. I have so many exciting things on the horizon, I just get so excited to think about them. One of these projects she went on to talk about was a quote, very exciting LGBTQ plus period piece that is in the works. She went on to add that it is quote, so exciting for me because I've always been in love with period pieces. I grew up being so drawn to them. like. Marie Antoinette, Memories of a Geisha, and Dangerous Liaisons, she said. I've always just loved the drama of period pieces, and adding that queer element is very exciting for me, so that's something that's on the horizon. If you didn't know, Lily Reinhardt came out as bisexual in June of 2020 by sharing a poster for an LGBTQ plus for hashtag Black Lives Matter protest on her Instagram story, which she said she would be attending with a caption reading, although I've never announced it publicly before, I am a proud bisexual woman. When she was 23, Lily opened up about her decision to publicly reveal that she's bisexual and why she was hesitant to do so in an interview with Nylon. She said, quote, I didn't want to come out and talk about it because I felt that bisexuality was becoming a trend. But I've supported the LGBTQ community since I was a little tween and it just felt organic. Reinhardt's coming out follows her recent breakup with Riverdale co-star Cole Sprouse. According to E! News, the couple split for the second time due to the coronavirus pandemic's stay-at-home orders making it difficult for the pair to stay connected, and it has become a more permanent split since. Regarding this, a source said, quote, Lily and Cole were in a good place when Riverdale was shut down due to the coronavirus outbreak, but they isolated separately and distance has never been a good thing for the relationship. When Cole and Lily are around each other often, things are very good. The relationship is very interesting and affectionate, but things become more complicated when they're apart. While many people do love a lesbian-centered period drama, the genre has also faced recent criticism surrounding both its focus on tragedy and its seemingly reliance on Caucasian cast members. A 2020 BuzzFeed article by queer writer Lauren Strapagale pointed out the film industry's fascination with the very, very specific dynamic. Now, while Reinhardt is developing projects for herself, she said she also wants to amplify more diverse voices and not necessarily just make things for her to be the lead in, saying quote, I don't want a white woman to be the lead role in everything that I do. Continuing, I would like to produce projects that are more diverse and aren't just me as a lead and tell different stories that I wouldn't necessarily really have room to be in. End quote. Lily has not really given too much info regarding the project specifically. We don't know if it's a movie or a series or anything really. All that we know is that it is a period piece. What period? We also don't know. And it centers around LGBTQ plus central characters, who we know nothing about. But the mystery is at least a little bit fun. I'm sure we will come to learn more over time and as more work is put into the pre-production. During her time on Riverdale, Reinhardt has stated in an episode of the Happy Sad Confused podcast that quote, You can only be so much of an adult on a CW show because you're not even really allowed to kiss with tongue. End quote. Due to that kind of family friendly restrictiveness, the actress has stated that she is looking forward to and has already been cast in more adult themed roles. She said quote, I have a lot of sort of dramatic, deep roles in my future after Riverdale. Definitely roles that you have not seen me in. I'm an adult woman and I'm going to start playing those more adult roles. 
end quote. And we have definitely already seen some of that. In 2019, she shared the screen with Jennifer Lopez in Hustlers, which follows a crew of New York City exotic dancers who begin to steal money by subduing stock traders and CEOs who visit their club, then running up their credit cards. In 2020, she starred in and was the executive producer of an R-rated romance movie called Chemical Hearts, based on the novel R Chemical Hearts by Crystal Sutherland, which deals with some pretty heavy themes. And this year, 2022, on August 17th, she starred in and produced the Netflix romantic dramedy Look Both Ways, where she plays one character in two opposing realities, one in which she becomes pregnant and remains in her hometown to raise her child, and another in which she moves to LA to pursue her dream career. Honestly, it's a pretty interesting premise for a movie. I'll have to go watch it. Her new self-produced project, this new period piece, as well as being mature in theme, also sounds like it'll give Reinhardt a chance to express her queer identity within the role, depending on what that role is, and what the movie's about, and everything really. Speaking on her past producing credits, specifically Chemical Hearts in 2020, Reinhardt talked about signing a first look deal with Amazon Studios under her very own production company, Small Victory Productions, saying, quote, I had such a great experience producing Chemical Hearts with Amazon, and I'm looking forward to expanding our relationship. She continued to say, Small Victory Productions will tell stories that explore the complexities of young adult, queer, diverse, and inclusive of everyone. In an interview with W Magazine, Lily also talked about her time during quarantine. According to the actress, she turned to a darker, more serious series for entertainment. The actress said she loved The Queen's Gambit and the character of Beth Harmon, the complicated chess prodigy played by Anya Taylor-Joy. In the interview, when asked, why did you pick this character and show, she responded, quote, I'm a sucker for a period piece, again. And I liked watching a young girl become an adult have her life completely change in just a few years. I relate to that. So maybe that will give us some slight clue into her new project, possibly inspired by the show, or maybe not at all. Again, we, we know nothing. On a completely unrelated note though, I just wanted to talk about this weird thing that happened in early 2021. Apparently in January 2021, an unknown person posed as Lily Reinhardt and her publicist to get into and do two interviews about the fifth season of Riverdale. Seventeen Magazine ran a new interview with her up on their site, which very quickly led to the discovery of a second interview with the Daily Express. Obviously, both interviews have since been taken down, with Seventeen Magazine issuing an apology after publishing the interview with someone pretending to be Lily Reinhardt. In the said apology, they wrote, quote, The person who contacted us was in fact an impersonator and had no connection to the Riverdale star, end quote. And then they apologized to both the actress and fans for the mix-up. Lily herself addressed the mix-up in her Instagram story, saying, quote, For some bizarre reason, some Someone impersonated me in an interview with Seventeen. Nothing inappropriate was said, but those were not my words and I wanted to address it." End quote. Lucas Hill Paul, who conducted the interview for the Daily Express, said, "...it's been brought to my attention that the interview I shared with Lily Reinhardt was fake, and someone has been impersonating Lily and her publicist. Obviously, I'm embarrassed and quite disturbed, and sincerely apologize to anyone who was misled by the article." I honestly haven't been able to find a single article about who this mystery imposter actually is or was. So if anyone knows anything, please leave it in the comments. I actually really want to know. Liam Payne was born three weeks early and because of that, he got seriously ill very frequently in his early life. Until he was four years old, he had to regularly go to the hospital due to kidney issues. At its worst, he got 16 injections in his arm in the morning and 16 injections in the evening. When he was a student, he also thought that he was going to be a professional sports star. For three years, he ranked in the top three 1500 meter runners in the country within his age group. He also took up boxing lessons at 12 years old before moving on to study music technology at a college. He was, however, born to perform when at only 12 years old, he entered into theater production companies. When Liam was only 14 years old, he made the decision that would go on to change his life by auditioning for the fifth season of The X Factor in front of the notoriously harsh critic, Simon Cowell. He moved on from the first round, but was subsequently cut at the boot camp stage. Then, miraculously, Simon changed his mind and decided to ask Liam to return for the judges house stage. He was cut again, but Cowell encouraged Liam to come back in two years. And come back he did. Now 16 years old, he sang Cry Me a River and received a standing ovation from Simon. He once again failed in the judge's house, but upon the suggestion of a guest judge, Simon put Liam with other boys named Harry Styles, Niall Horan, Louis Tomlinson, and Zayn Malik. 
They began qualifying in the groups category and came in third place on the show. Following the X Factor, the group were dubbed One Direction and signed to Cowell's Entertainment Company. Their debut single, What Makes You Beautiful, instantly became an international success, and from there, One Direction became one of the biggest boy bands from 2011 to 2015. They had a picture perfect image and were widely loved by their young female audience. But after the release of the group's fifth album called Made in the AM, they decided to go on an indefinite hiatus. When asked why they decided to cease One Direction, Harry Styles said in a 2017 interview that they quote, didn't want to exhaust the fan base. We all thought too much of the group to let that happen. I love the band and would never rule anything out in the future. The band changed my life, gave me everything. Although Harry hinted at the idea of a reunion, it seems now like things were much darker behind the scenes. After they broke up, the entire band basically only spoke well of each other. There didn't really seem to be any animosity. The individuals in One Direction then went on to have moderately successful solo careers, except for Harry Styles, who actually way blew up and continues to make, an in and continues to make insane moves. Liam, for his part, pivoted to more dance-style tracks rather than sticking to the formula he and his bandmates had created with One Direction. He released his biggest single, Strip That Down, in 2017. His latest song was a Christmas single featuring the TikTok girl, Charlie D'Amelio. In 2016, a year before One Direction split, when Liam was 24 years old, he and his girlfriend at the time, Cheryl Tweedy, had a son together. They would split a year after their son was born, more on that later. In 2019, Liam also started dating a model named Maya Henry, and they announced their engagement in 2020 before ending it, ending it in 2021. Then the couple got back together later that year, got engaged again, and then split for the second time in May 2022. And you'd think that Liam would kind of just do his own thing, but that was until he decided to become a guest on Logan Paul's podcast called Impulsive. While he was there, he basically exposed the entire dirty underbelly of One Direction as well as his own personal life. He admitted to having an alcohol issue while throwing back a few fingers of whiskey, so it could very well be that he wouldn't normally have revealed as much as he did, but he may have spilled the beans due to intoxication. He revealed that, despite being best friends now, he absolutely detested Louis Tomlinson. Quote, I wasn't used to rowdy guys or whatever else. Louis was wild and he wanted to be wild, that's his spirit. And also, he's my best mate now, but in the band, we hated each other. Like, to come to blows hated each other. He also credited himself with being the glue of One Direction, leading the group from the stage and making sure that everyone's doing choreography moves properly. Liam also touched on his beef with Zayn Malik. When Logan brought up a 2020 beef between Jake Paul and Zayn, with Gigi chiming in, Liam stated, quote, she tweeted something about getting yourself a respectful man or something. That one didn't age very well. Everyone figured that was in reference to the alleged violent altercation between Zayn and Gigi's mother, Yolanda. He also said that there were many reasons why he disliked his former bandmate and that the two never got along. It seemed like there was tons of infighting between the band members. He also spoke of a moment where they fought, quote, there was one time where there was an argument backstage and one member in particular threw me up a wall. So I said to him, if you don't remove those hands, there's a huge likelihood you'll never use them again. While he didn't mention the particular band member by name, the singer hinted earlier in the episode that he and Louis had a tense relationship for a long time, so hopefully it was him, I don't know. He also spoke about what it was like being a father at such a young age. His son's name is Bear, and Liam spoke about how one of his favorite things is taking his son to school. Quote, it's so much fun and I know he loves it too. It happens, you know, once a week or twice a week. I love taking care of him and watching him grow. Hopefully he does a little bit better than I did. I'll get into what fans thought about it much later, but a bunch of people took this as Liam not spending enough time with his son as he should. Liam also mentioned not being able to see his kid a lot because of being an artist and how grateful he is for his ex taking over basically the entire parenting role. To add even more drama to the fire too, Liam is having some serious girl trouble. While I've spoken before about him dating the model Maya Henry and they got engaged twice, as it is now, they are broken up. Liam reportedly also had a fling with a model named Aliana Mala before now, but it's kind of messy as to whether that's still going on or not. According to the Daily Mail, it was previously revealed that Liam Payne and Aliana Mala had unfollowed each other on Instagram, seeming to suggest that their romance was over. But it is unclear whether the singer had called it quits with the influencer, as insiders told Mail Online that Aliana is under the impression that the pair is still going strong, while Maya believes the romance is over. 
Speaking to Mail Online, one source claimed the pair are still together but keeping it low key, while another simply described the romance as a drunken 48 hour fling. Some people, however, think that Liam cheated on Maya as his ex fiance addresses photos of Liam with another woman at the bar. She said on Twitter, quote, Please stop sending me these pictures of my fiance wrapped around another woman. This is not me, and it's hard enough knowing this has happened without seeing it. Enough now. As for One Direction fans, well, let's say they are seriously not happy with Liam for being so forthcoming about the issues with One Direction. A lot of fans were super upset about Liam's dig at Zayn over the Yolanda thing. One Twitter user wrote, quote, Liam talking about Zayn as if he didn't cheat on his fiance last week. Another said, quote, If Liam Payne talking it about Zayn on the Logan Paul podcast isn't an indicator of how irrelevant his career is, then I don't know what is. Well, a third wrote, quote, Zayn choosing to keep certain aspects of his life private and Liam airing it out voluntarily to Logan Paul is a prime example of how wicked this man truly is. One Direction fans were also outraged over Payne claiming his 2017 debut solo single, Strip That Down, outsold everyone within the band. They shared screenshots showing that songs such as Harry Styles' Grammy winning Watermelon Sugar and Malik's Don't Wanna Live Forever have surpassed Strip That Down with over a billion streams each and reminded Payne that his critically panned 2019 album, LP1, peaked at number 111 on the Billboard 200. One fan even wrote, quote, nobody, I mean nobody has ever said put on that new Liam Payne song. Yikes. Jeanette McCurdy carries the producer, director, singer, and former actress titles. She got her start in youth acting fairly early, and by the time she was a preteen, Jeanette accumulated mass success. Her starring in Nickelodeon's hit teen comedy, iCarly, alongside Miranda Cosgrove when Jeanette was 14, eventually led to a spin off of her character opposite Ariana Grande for their Nick show, Sam and Cat. Following her leave from Nickelodeon, Jeanette moved on to star in Netflix's Between series and also briefly settled into a short lived country music career with Capitol Records Nashville. However, her outside success could not combat her deeply resentful, pent up feelings of her working resume, where she felt ultimately unsatisfied with her life. Naturally, Jeanette turned to hard liquor and unhealthy romantic relationships to cope, but eventually ended up quitting both when she realized this didn't work for her, and instead chose to pursue writing and directing by 2017. Jeanette currently maintains a hosting position for her Empty Inside podcast, catered to breaking those uncomfortable topic conversations with her guests. Jeanette has also since declared her freedom from her past self and is ready to throw away that part of her for good. But before we break all of that down, let's rewind a bit. Jeanette was birthed in Long Beach, California under the full name of Jeanette Michelle Faye McCurdy. Her parents were Deborah and Mark McCurdy and Jeanette grew up in a small part of Garden Grove, Cali with her three older brothers Marcus, Scott and Dustin. Jeanette enjoys figure skating and has partaken in many competitions. She also owns three dogs by the names of Snoopy, Chewy and Musashi as well as two turtles named Tutsen and Zeus. Jeanette's inspiration for pursuing acting was from her idol Harrison Ford and his work in Star Wars. This resulted in Jeanette landing the role of Cassidy Guilford in an episode of Mad TV in 2000, when she was only 8 years old. In 2001, Jeanette moved on to play Anna Markov in Shadow Fur, and the following year, Jeanette took on Jackie Trent in CSI Crime Scene Investigation and Mary Fields in My Daughter's Tears. By 2003, Jeanette obtained the opportunity to act opposite Harrison himself with their work in Hollywood Homicide. In that same year, Jeanette was playing the role of Amanda Simmons in the Taylor Simmons film. At this point, Jeanette had more than 40 TV serials and 12 films under her belt as a child actor, earning her a multitude of awards and nominations in that short time of filming. Some of these included Young Artist Award nominations in various categories for Strong Medicine in 2005, The Last Day of Summer in 2008, and iCarly in 2009. For iCarly, Jeanette also bagged wins at the Teen Choice Awards in 2009, the Australian Kids Choice Awards in 2012, and the OG Kids Choice Awards in 2012 as well for her work under the Nickelodeon series. But this all came crashing down for Jeanette when she made the decision to quit acting in 2017 to focus on her then soon to be writing and directing career. Her directorial debut came in 2018 with a short film called Kenny. Following this was The Grave, The McCurdy's and Strong Independent Women. Her brief return to acting came about in 2020 with her quote tragic comedy one woman show called I'm Glad My Mom Died. In July of that same year her Empty Inside podcast was launched and by March 2021 Jeanette admitted during one of her hostings that she most likely would not be returning to acting again at that point. As for her writing Jeanette was a columnist for Seventeen magazine and a writer for Wall Street Journal in her time, to name two. 
For Jeanette, her fame was indeed curated from her acting, but her additional talents in singing and songwriting only brought her further fame. She has numerous songwriting credits from the music she's personally sung, but Jeanette is also a screenwriter and producer among her other hobbies, with an all-rounder performance leaving a lasting impression in the world of entertainment and social media. Aside from her fairly busy celebrity status though, Jeanette is also a popular figure for her philanthropist at heart nature. When her late friend Cody Waters passed, Jeanette dedicated her second single, Homeless Heart, to him. She donated 20% of the proceeds from sales to the Cody Waters Foundation to pay respects to children suffering from cancer. With this, Jeanette also holds the Star Power Ambassador title for the Starlight Children's Foundation. One final talent one can say Jeanette produces though is her uncanny ability to avoid getting caught up in loads of scandals during her years in the direct limelight. The only real scandal anyone can think of when they think of Jeanette was her failure to attend the Knicks Choice Awards function in spite of being invited. Of course, most now know this controversy spiraled into complications when Jeanette accused the network of favoring her Sam and Cat co-star Ariana. And the backlash from this was so heavy that Nick had to cancel broadcasting for the series after a single season to avoid any more issues. In conclusion, the rumors were soon cleared by both young stars at the time to reveal that they were both still good friends. Now remember when I told you about Jeanette being ready to pack up her old life and move on at the start? Here's how it pertains to what we've learned so far. Jeanette's writing career quickly grew into a force to be reckoned with when she penned an article on her family struggles while her mother was battling cancer for several extensive years. The work was published in the Wall Street Journal and the article attracted many readers who felt great sympathy for the words on the pages. Jeanette's multifaceted talents are unlike that of many, which has earned her the respect and admiration of a wide portion of the target audience the entertainment industry caters to. Her newest book, a memoir titled I'm Glad My Mom Died, is based on her life growing up and is attention grabbing in every way to say the least. Not to mention that Jeanette has admitted she meant every word of it genuinely. Her hopes with this book is for readers to understand why she created such a bold statement by the end of it. The now 30 year old has detailed in her book how her mom, Deborah, was a quote narcissist who emotionally, mentally and physically took advantage of her. Jeanette detailed how it was Deborah who forced her into an acting career as a younging and also encouraged her to obtain a dangerous series of eating disorders. She also discussed her mother giving her showers through her late teen years with claims that Jeanette didn't wash her hair accurately. It was Deborah who pushed Jeanette to work long and grueling hours despite her sickness at times and continually gave her daughter breast and vaginal exams until Jeanette was 17 because she feared her daughter developing cancer as well. Deborah was described as restricting to Jeanette's social and dating life until her 20s and being overall quote cruel, demanding and hostile to her child pleasing daughter, all while Deborah screamed at her husband in front of their kids and threw dishes around the house. According to Jeanette, she didn't seek therapy for her troubles until after her mother's passing in 2013. This is where she began to accept her past and fully deal with the trauma she experienced. It took years of work, but Jeanette is now actively proceeding to extensively improve herself and share her story with the world. While penning her body of work, Jeanette recalls it being a quote, emotional roller coaster. From 2007 to 2015, Jeanette was acting out an aggressively sassy, bright Sam Puckett alongside Miranda's bubbly, glamorously awkward Carly Shay. And again in her spinoff with Ariana Grande's ditzy airheaded Cat Valentine character. The dynamics of these two shows had kids and tweens obsessed from the very start, as Jeanette's spunky, cute, thin, and fair skinned character, much like many of the other Hollywood girls churned out by the industry at the time, was a natural fan attractor. But her start as mentioned prior was not just Jeanette's hard work alone, but through the guidance and heavy supervision of her mother, who brought Jeanette up in Orange County solely with the intention of making her daughter a famous actress. The seemingly not so devastating loss for Jeanette at 21, from her lifelong personal personal and professional guidance in life clearly proves that if Jeanette is right about one thing, it has to be her childhood experiences shaping her to be exactly who she is nowadays. I'm genuinely glad. If she were alive, I'd still be trapped. Every important decision in my life wouldn't have been possible. Her book is raw and telling in a clear and unflinchingly all honest manner. It describes thoroughly Deborah's desire to raise a mini actor as a wannabe actor herself, but also how Deborah was wildly harmful to her youngest daughter in the process. Most recently though, Jeanette seems to be moving in a higher direction direction to pour out her experiences into the memoir, I'm sure she's hoping to heal others who are going through something similar. The exploration of her childhood and the career she never desired, mixed in with being a writer now and how that has shaped her has deemed this piece one for the books. In a discussion of her writing rebellion and the hyper focused reputation of her mom, Jeanette explained, My mom didn't deserve her pedestal. She was a narcissist in ways that will forever impact me. In regards to the people closest to Jeanette after her mom's death, Miranda has recently stepped forward to say she did not know every detail of what was occurring behind the scenes with Jeanette. Miranda was detailed by Jeanette to be shy, but outgoing and sparky. 
and took Jeanette out of her comfort zone throughout most of their friendship. Jeanette further described Miranda as a breath of fresh air in her life. In response to Miranda calling Jeanette's recently revealed past, she said, quote, When you're young, you're so in your own head. You can't imagine that people around you are having much harder struggles. You don't expect things like that from the person in the room who's making everyone laugh. Overall, it's no surprise that when Jeanette took a peek back into her childhood rise to fame, she discovered the fact that Deborah did not shield her from the dangers of Hollywood back then. She even embarked on a thoughtful journey about the time when her parental figure failed to intervene Jeanette being served alcohol, authorized by quote, the creator. During another occurrence, Jeanette had pleaded within herself that her mom would have stopped the pressure regarding her teen bikini photo shoot from happening. Rather, Jeanette explained how her mom would constantly remind her of how envious everyone was of her and how much they wanted to have what she did. To expand, Jeanette revealed, my whole childhood and adolescence was very exploited. It still gives my nervous system a reaction to say it. There were cases where people had the best intentions and maybe didn't know what they were doing, and also cases where they knew exactly what they were doing. Jeanette's memoir is both cheeky and gut-wrenching, with mentions of her once developing jealousy over her former co-star Ariana's success and how she grew to love Miranda despite her mom's warnings not to. But in the wake of it all lies a truth and emotional healing path for Jeanette to one day return to the world of historical public scrutiny in a way that only she is able. Quote, I think seeing yourself is particularly difficult with growing up in the public eye because you're so public facing and seen as one thing. That makes the reality of you so much more unseen and invalidated and unacknowledged. But now because because I see myself, I can accept being seen by others. Sean Anderson, known for his rap alias Big Sean, was born in Santa Monica, California before moving to Detroit, Michigan when he was only three years old, where he was raised by his mother and grandmother. In his later years of high school, Sean began showing off his love of rap music on a weekly rap battle contest held by a Detroit hip hop radio station. Big Sean is characterized for his smooth rap and creative rhyming style. The rapper got his chance at fame in 2005 when he heard that Kanye West would be in town to do a radio interview. Heading down to the station, Sean met West and asked if he could show the multi-platinum artist his freestyling skills. In a 2009 MTV interview, Big Sean explained that he used his relationship with the radio staff to get close to Kanye, who was reluctant at first to listen to the young artist's music. He ended up giving Sean 16 bars to rap for him once Sean explained that Kanye was his hero. Like something out of a movie, Kanye let Anderson rap for him while they walked out of the station. Sean stated about the experience, quote, As we got to the entrance of the radio station, we stopped in the middle of the doorway. He started looking at me and Bob his head. Kanye later described, quote, I could hear his personality and character and style in it. He just walked up to me and said a rap and I said, I'm gonna sign you. I wasn't signing acts at the time, but I was so inspired by what he did. His voice was very compelling, his lyrics were very clever, and the melodies and the way he was putting it together and his story. Two years later, Big Sean was signed to Good Music, Kanye West's record label, at the end of 2007. Big Sean would go on to produce mixtapes and albums with the many popular hip hop and rap artists, including Drake and Kanye. Outside of his rap career, in 2011, Big Sean was arrested at a concert after a 17-year-old girl claimed she was inappropriately touched and the rapper made unwanted advances towards her. He later accepted a plea deal for misdemeanor counts of unlawful imprisonment. Basically what this means is that legally, Big Sean admitted guilt to forcibly holding and restraining the 17-year-old, but in pleading guilty, all he has to do is pay a $750 fine while the more serious charges were dropped. Personally, Big Sean maintains that he quote, did not engage in any type of sexual misconduct. Outside of his incident with the law, Big Sean has maintained a moderately successful rap career, winning an MTV Music Video Award and a handful of BET awards. He is known mostly for his various romantic relationships with larger celebrities. In early 2013, Big Sean dated the late Glee star Naya Rivera, even getting engaged before they decided to end their relationship in 2014. Later that same year, Big Sean started dating pop superstar Ariana Grande, a relationship that subsequently exposed Sean to fans that would otherwise not have heard his music if they were unfamiliar with rap. They would eventually break up though, only a few months later, citing conflicting work schedules that made it difficult for them to see one another. Sean is now dating Janae Aiko and has been since 2016. Sadly, the couple briefly broke up in 2019 due to a miscarriage that stressed the relationship. They are now reconciled and continue to date. It wasn't until very recently though, on December 18th, that Big Sean shook the rap world by exposing his former record label holder, Kanye West, in a Drink Champs interview. In early November, Kanye West also appeared on Drink Champs, wherein he stated that, quote, when I die, my tombstone will say, I deserve to be here because I signed Big Sean. He also stated that, quote, the worst thing he has ever done is sign Big Sean. 
Kanye's reasoning behind his disappointment in Big Sean was that when he ran for office in 2020, the Detroit rapper sided with the Democratic Party instead of Kanye. The Yeezy rapper also mentions that he considers both Big Sean and John Legend sellouts for their political decisions and for not supporting Kanye in his bid for the presidency. Fast forward a month when Anderson appears on Drink Champs, Nori expresses his disbelief at hearing Kanye's opinions of Big Sean and how unbelievable it seems that he would feel this way towards a Detroit rapper. Big Sean expresses that at first he felt like it was funny, that and he quote, took it personally because I'm the only artist who put out five albums under good music. Big Sean then clarifies that he will love Kanye for everything he has done for him in his rap career, before stating that he thinks it is unfair for him to make such targeted attacks after Big Sean did everything to support Kanye in the studio without credit because of Kanye's role in lifting Sean's career off the ground. All this is well and good typical celebrity beef until Big Sean reveals that he had to spend his own money auditing his label because quote, millions of dollars are missing and you can tell when millions of dollars are missing. Big Sean alleged that he spent hundreds of thousands of dollars finding the missing money, thinking initially that Universal Music owed it to him, but finding out later that the money had been paid to none other than Good Music, Kanye's label. Big Sean then says to his interviewers, quote, If someone owed you $500,000, how would you feel? What if they owed you a million? What if they owed you three million? What if they owed you five million? What if they owed you six? The Detroit rapper claims he felt hurt by Kanye, who is ridiculously rich but doesn't set things right for financially. This claim that Kanye owes Big Sean potentially millions of dollars is massive. Sean later states that he was upset by not receiving his six million because quote, you owe me this money that probably ain't nothing to you. That's life changing money to me that could go towards things I'm trying to do. I'm building a movie theater. I'm trying to help my community. Sean also takes shots at Kanye's hypocrisy, posting a tweet stating that right after his Drink Champs interview back in November, Kanye was hanging out with Sean, who stepped away from good music in October of this year, citing the need for a better business deal. Kanye's claims that he would give Big Sean his master recordings to him so that he could rightfully own his own music instead of the record label owning them has also yet to happen. Big Sean further states that he finds it ironic that Kanye would sing the praises of Drake, a man who was quote, talking the most shit and then drag Sean despite him being loyal to a fault. Anderson also insinuates that he feels Kanye wasn't actually mad about the supposed non-endorsement of his presidential campaign, but actually because Kanye felt slighted because Sean refused to feature him on an already completed song that was going up for pre-order the very next day. Sean stated that Kanye was featured on two other songs in the album, but when Ye wanted to be on the third, Drake and Sean both felt it unnecessary to change up an already completed track just to let Kanye feature on it because he wanted to. Despite fitting Kanye into the track, production failed to include it in the final version of the song and it was released without the feature. Something that upset Kanye, who directed his anger towards Sean, even though Sean quote, helped him write the verse. Big Sean was so upset by Kanye's comments that when Kanye attempted to reconcile by meeting with him and his mom to quote, begin healing on both ends, he declined because he felt so humiliated by the comments. Fans reactions to this exposing interview are mixed, some siding with Kanye because of his original outreach he did all those years ago to propel Sean to fame. Others though praise Big Sean for his response to Yee's comments. One Twitter user stated, quote, Not many at his level carry themselves as well as Big Sean does. Spoke on Drink Champs with great articulation, with the right amount of assertiveness and passion. The way he stopped Nori a few times to get his point across and to make sure he felt his point was awesome. And while a lot of media attention surrounding the controversy headlines the money owed as a source of the riff, it seems that during the interview Sean is more concerned with Kanye's disparaging comments and how it seems to disregard the years of history between the two artists. Comments that are likely to cause a big rift between the former friends and collaborators.